Rock, you want to have your notes on the screen? Okay. Okay, okay. No problem. Yeah. Hey, hey. Sorry that the problem with the last session is that usually people are running for the trains and stuff. That's really sorry that you're in the last panel, but it's really hard to put all those stuff it's like in a reasonable way. Okay. 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 Microphone something, so I have to ask you to sit closer because it's easier for you to hear from our video. The technical staff is always failing us. The chair for the last session panel will be Sasha Chaval again. So, yes, technical staff. In a more intimate environment. <laughs> okay, the last session of the second month, no, the third month. Yes, is Luke Munzer from Bonn University and Park Manifestor at Catholic University. She will talk about the math. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I would like to thank uh, the organizer for having us in this uh, conference. Uh, first of all, my doctoral thesis is uh, centered about kitchen culture, uh, uh, diet and cooking uh, boats uh, in greater Syria, comparing with the um, residue uh, organic uh, analysis. Um, I'm doing the cooperation between Bonn University in Germany and Basmani Beter in Hungary. But uh, today I would like to, uh, to share some picture of uh, glaze mamluk uh, uh, ceramic from uh, Damascus citadel to examine the daily life inside the, the citadel. Uh, in the following presentation, we'll start with an introduction followed by uh, a brief uh, historical uh, geography of uh, the region. After that, some examples of uh, glaze mamluk tableware. 
to examine the material uh, used and the types of uh, goods consumed, as well as to analyze the daily life. Tableware is uh, special in the uh, history of uh, ceramics. It's not just about uh, practical uh, dishes, but it also uh, tells us about culture, how skilled people uh, were at making things, and what life uh, was uh, uh, like in the medieval. Uh, one place that was uh, really good at making uh, pottery was medieval Damascus. They made all uh, sorts of pottery that uh, showed how rich uh, and diverse their culture was. In the, midi um, in the Middle Islamic era, Damascus was a busy place uh, where uh, art, trade, and uh, learning uh, thrived. And uh, the pottery uh, they made there wasn't just for eating, it was also a way of uh, showing of their artistic uh, skills and culture. They put uh, a lot of effort into making each piece uh, unique and meaningful. Syria is located in uh, West uh, Asia, at the eastern end of the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And Damascus is the capital uh, of uh, Syria, located in the southwestern part of uh, the country. It's the uh, one of the oldest inhabited uh, metropolis uh, throughout the ages, and it dates to uh, the mid uh, the middle of uh, third millennium BC. And uh, during the Aramic period, the settlement uh, grew into a city, and then uh, it followed the Hellenistic uh, city style. It uh, returned its shape uh, during both the Roman and Byzantine uh, periods. Under the Umayyad period, Damascus uh, proposed and became the uh, capital of the state. However, it lost its uh, strong uh, position under the Abbasid and briefly came under the rule of Fatimid. The city was controlled by the uh, Zinqiyin and Ayyubid uh, states and then the Mamluks uh, before being conquered by the uh, Ottomans. The citadel of uh, Damascus, which is the main case uh, study, is uh, located in the northwest corner of the uh, city uh, walls, uh, and here the Babkisan and Babsharki, there were the workshop of, uh, of the pottery. Um, unlike most citadels uh, in the world that, ha that are built on the top of uh, mountains, this citadel uh, stands on the flatlands. Uh, the current citadel dates primarily to the Ayyubid period while incorporating parts of uh, the older Saljuk fortress. Uh, the citadel can be uh, divided in two main uh, periods. Uh, the first one, uh, Seljuk uh, Citadel and Nuruk Fortification, as we can see in the blue uh, line. Uh, this Seljuk founded the uh, citadel as an emirate uh, residence with a trench uh, surrounding the citadel. Then the fortifications were built under the rule of Sultan Nur al-Din Zinki and then the Ayyubid Sultan uh, Salah al-Din to repel the crusader attacks during that uh, period. And the second, uh, the second uh, is um, in the yellow uh, uh, line. Uh, here is the second uh, period in the Ayyubid uh, citadel erected by Al-Adil outside the borders of the oldest citadel. It consists uh, of 12 uh, fortified uh, towers uh, connected by uh, galleries beside some important civil building using a new architecture uh, and military styles. After that, the citadel became the uh, residence of the Mamluk governor uh, of the city. As a result, the structure contained uh, the city governor's uh, military offices and financial um, services. In addition, uh, in um, the Mamluk period, uh, there is two mosques and madrasa and one hammam in uh, inside the, uh, the city. Uh, the ceramics that uh, have been excavated from uh, this citadel are of great uh, value as uh, they provide the circular information of uh, dating the different uh, levels of occupation uh, within a complex uh, strat stratigraphic uh, context. Moreover, their uh, presence or absence helps us to gain a better understanding of how people uh, move around inside the building. Uh, the first example uh, uh, about the tableware is the uh, Sigrafiet wares. Here are three uh, distinguishable uh, categories, uh, categories of uh, Sigrafiet wares. Uh, the first group consists uh, of uh, balls with fine uh, Sigrafiet form, and many of these balls uh, feature uh, a large uh, rim and uh, low uh, ring base. The designs are uh, geometric cross, uh, uh, cross patterns, uh, spirals, wavy lines, and uh, stylus. 
This type of uh, sigraffiet were emerged in the early 13th century in the area and uh, probably absent uh, from the late uh, 14th, 15th century. The second example is uh, uh, sigraffietto, or we can say uh, couched uh, sigraffietto. Uh, this ammonochrome yellow glaze with uh, uh, splashes of uh, uh, green, and the fabric is uh, usually orange brown uh, or rich brown uh, clay with whitish uh, slip. Um, the, the fabric uh, is um, fine uh, quartz uh, with, the, with the fine limestone or small limestone uh, mixture with the, with the uh, clay. And it seems to be, um, and this word it doesn't appear in, um, in the Crusader assemblages. It seems to be well uh, represented uh, in Syria and dated to late 14th century. A third group is the uh, Sigraffietto uh, with an ex external uh, decoration. Uh, here in this example, ball with uh, straight wheels with a uh, low uh, carination. Uh, also, uh, orange brown gray, white slip from um, the interior and exterior uh, surface. And this glaze is usually well melted and uh, firmly um, adhering, and uh, the green glaze on the both uh, sides. Uh, designs uh, consist of uh, uh, fine combined sigraffetto and sometimes combined with uh, couched sigraffetto. Uh, the other uh, example is the slip uh, bented wares. Um, this uh, wear uh, are among uh, the most popular uh, list wear uh, over the centuries. Uh, two main groups can be distinguished. Uh, the first group uh, and uh, the main the main group uh, consists of uh, vessels with geometric designs, and uh, the designs are bented in the white slip on the gray body and then covered with a transparent yellow or green uh, glaze, uh, which returned uh, the bented design uh, yellow or green on the dark background of an uh, slip degree. Uh, the bented design of uh, the local uh, wares are mostly simple uh, line, liner patterns, while uh, the imported ones are mainly with the uh, spire. The second group uh, is um, so-called reserved uh, slipware. These uh, balls um, are decorated with irregular batches of uh, white slip, uh, deliberately uh, leaving uh, part of the interior of the vessels undecorated, and this group is less common uh, than the former. Slip bented wear uh, started to appear around uh, the second half of the 12th century, and it was a trend during the Mamluk period. And uh, these wares continued in production during the Ottoman uh, period, but it, in a different uh, clay and uh, shapes, and the bending uh, design were uh, reduced uh, to mere vertical streaks. Uh, another example is um, the mold uh, made balls appear in different sizes and glaze colors, but the general shape is always the same. Uh, unlike the, the rest of uh, the Mamluk glaze uh, wares, these mold made vessels are glazed inside and out, and the large, uh, larger balls are uh, decorated in two registers, the upper uh, broad one um, carries an inscription of uh, blessing, uh, while the lower narrow register bears um, a vertical or geometric design. And the last one here, uh, this uh, um, gla glazed, simple monochrome uh, glazed uh, balls. Uh, also, um, this is um, appeared during uh, the Mamluk and continue in, in Ottoman period, but these uh, vessels were usually larger in Ottoman and the corridor open with a, a grooved and thumb uh, indent base ring. Um, we have uh, a lot of uh, group of uh, fritware. Uh, the 12th century marked a pivotal uh, moment in the history of the fine uh, tableware production. And during that time, uh, uh, butteries in, in Egypt and Syria began using an artifact uh, soft uh, uh, bust body made of mixture of uh, crushed quartz, white clay, and glaze fret to create a high quality uh, wares. And during uh, the 12th century, uh, stone based production in uh, Damascus expanded, uh, expanded uh, alongside urban uh, growth after the uh, unification of Syria and the arrival of Nur ad Din in the city. A local market uh, for this high uh, in the um, product uh, exists in the uh, citadel and possibly other parts of the city. 
Uh, the citadel uh, pottery uh, except many uh, similarities with the material culture of the wide region, but it also reflects the uh, city physical location. The city primary um, catered to its uh, ceramic needs as um, evidenced by the numerous local elements in the citadel, typology and the relative uh, scarcity of imported works during the city at uh, the study period. Uh, along with uh, the strong uh, probability that uh, most of its uh, fine wares were produced locally, the majority of uh, the glaze and unglazed common wares have uh, a distinctly local uh, character. Uh, even those uh, belonging uh, to uh, families uh, found um, elsewhere in Bilad Asham. The Citadel Pottery provides an um, insight into life in an illiteral uh, context within Damascus uh, society. However, only a few uh, handmade wares have been uh, discovered in the Citadel of uh, Damascus itself. And in conclusion, a ceramic table discovered in and around the Citadel had uh, a diverse range of uh, shapes and uh, uses uh, catering to the needs of its uh, inhabitants. And these uh, artifacts were used for everyday uh, meals, such as a uh, simple bowl and blood, as well as uh, integrally decorated vessels that were reserved uh, for special occasion, uh, okay, uh, occasions. And uh, these uh, objects provide uh, valuable insight into the social uh, hierarchies and uh, ritual of the time. Perhaps uh, uh, festus and uh, catering um, were likely a uh, common uh, bliss. Beyond uh, their uh, functional uh, role, ceramic tableware uh, served as powerful uh, symbol of identity and uh, stats. Decoration uh, uh, motifs um, inspired by natural geometric patterns and um, calligraphic inscriptions um, uh, adorned these objects, reflecting the uh, religion, culture, and artistic uh, symbolism. Of uh, the time for uh, the illiterate, uh, owning uh, a set of uh, finely uh, crafted ceramic was not only uh, a display of uh, wealth, but also uh, a means of um, asserting, asserting uh, one's uh, social standing and test. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Hello everyone, I hope you can hear me correctly. I want to thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to present my PhD work. Well, uh, it's the very start of the PhD, so it's more like I, I am going to present you some problems that we don't have the answers to yet. <laughs> so I hope this will be uh, uh, understandable, yeah? or at least uh, it will give you some material to think about. So in the shadow of giants, why did I choose that? Because actually, when we talk about the early Middle Ages in Western Europe, what are we thinking about? The Franks, Anglo-Saxons, the Vikings, which we call them Scandinavians, but yeah. yeah? But what we don't think about are smaller regions like Brittany. Brittany wasn't part of the Frankish parts of the of Europe. Neither were, uh, was it part of the Anglo-Saxon sphere of influence or something like that. It was alone, let's say it like that. So I'm going to try and explain that uh, small part of the European world uh, uh, continent in uh, this uh, in this presentation. So at first, why uh, do we need to know it? Because, well, I'm uh, in, uh, I'm studying in Brittany, so of course I want to 
understand more about that uh, place. But it's also because the uh, textual evidence is non-existent in uh, Brittany. Uh, the only uh, textual evidence we have is like um, a chronicle from the 12th century that uh, that recaps the uh, early Middle Ages. So it isn't very well. We have to think it was influenced by other people and not by the early Middle Ages. And also. Um, the only textual evidence we have about the Bretons in that time period is from the Franks. And the Franks are, of course, biased against them because it's literally said in uh, the uh, chronicles of the Frankish kingdom that um, those barbar barbarians, those uh, 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 monsters, they, they are Christians, but they are not really like Christians. Not that they are not like us. It's, re it's really quite... Uh, well, today you would say uh, xenophobic yeah, towards them. So why? Uh, so that is the idea that the French have. Uh, uh, the archaeology in France still has a little bit about Brittany because you have to imagine that there's no um, archaeological excavations uh, for the time period. It's uh, at the university we called it uh, archaeological desert because they're just two or three excavations about the Middle Ages, uh, about the early Middle Ages in Brittany. So, but those two excavations give us so much to think about because we don't have like, how to say, um, typical Breton uh, materials. We all, uh, it seems we have only imported or uh, things like that, but um, yeah. So I had to deal with I, what I was given. Let's say it's like that. So I had to take the historical evidence, so textual evidence, chronicles, and quaternaries. Uh, sorry, and the uh, uh, historical uh, historians uh, that researched the time period. But there's a problem with that because, let's say, um, during the 20th century, that most uh, people who worked on Breton history were like Bretons. So they didn't, they, and sometimes they were like, uh, they wanted to uh, lighten up their own history and make themselves more important in, in this case, uh, which of course has given problems on, all on its own. Uh, but that's a histor uh, historian's uh, point of view and problem, so that's not my problem. I try to see um, what happened in Brittany through archaeology. Yeah. But then again, we are faced with a problem because there are urban centers like Rennes and Nantes in the early Middle Ages, but those are on the borderland with the Frankish king, uh, kingdom and later the Carolingian Empire. So we have still a problem with that because they are Franks, but they are Breton uh, uh, sometimes. So, And then again, rural settlements, it was all of wood in that time. And the problem is that the soil in Brittany doesn't permit conservation of wood or organic materials whatsoever. We have, we don't have bones, we don't have uh, wood, we don't have leather, we have nothing. So the only things we have are like cerami ceramics or stone buildings. And if they didn't build in stone, well, we're screwed. <laughs> Let's say it like that. But the only thing we have is fortifications. Uh, urban uh, fortifications like in Rennes and Nantes, yet again, where uh, we are faced with the problem that it was on the borderland with the Franks. So, uh, and um, the only like uh, urban fortification we had in Rennes were those of the Romans. So they, uh, it isn't from the Middle Ages. Uh, and then we have the rural rural fortifications that are like. They are fortified, but at the same time, they're more like villages, and we don't really know what they are like. Huh? So that is the problem I'm facing. Huh? So uh, I'm going to give you a small historical context, and it's um, until the 8th and 9th century, we don't really know what happened in Brittany. They are probably smaller kingdoms, or smaller... Uh, we don't exactly know what they were, but it was known by textual evidence that um, the Franks raided into Brittany too. And, but the 
when Bretons raided back, and of course, in the textual evidence, the raids of the Franks were uh, completely justified because of the uh, Bretons that were pa uh, pagans or Christians, so they didn't care much about it. Huh? But when Bretons raided back, they were like, uh, oh, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. huh? So um, at a certain moment, the Franks also were a little bit fed up with this. Huh? So they named one person, the Count of Bun, it's a town in southern Brittany. Yeah. They named uh, Nominoe, that was the Count, uh, Mrs. Dominicus, yeah, so that he would centralize the Breton uh, people and at least have, they would have some degree of control over them and they wouldn't have to deal with uh, Breton raids anymore. It backfired horribly because actually Nominoe uh, was only loyal to Louis the Pious, but not to the people after him. So, of course, when there's the uh, civil war between the sons of Louis the Pious, what happens? Nominoe immediately attacks uh, Charles the Bold. And it gives um, a war that is just too long to explain, actually. And at the end, Iris Poe, the son of Nominoe, is named uh, like sub-king of Brittany. Uh, he still has to pay homage to Charles the Bold, but he's a king. Huh? That backfires also because Eris Poe gets killed by his son-in-law, the son-in-law gets killed by his son-in-law, it's Game of Thrones. Huh? Huh? And in all of this, of course, what happens, people from around the Brittany are trying to get hold of the place, like, um, thanks to, uh, again, the annals of uh, the Frankish kingdom, we know that Frankish, uh, Frankish, Scandinavian, Saxon, so the people from northern Germany, and Anglo-Saxons, all come to uh, uh, Brittany to, uh, well, they call it uh, uh, mercenaries, but we don't know what they were. But, uh, but what is clear, thanks to textual evidence, is that when there was a power vacuum, there would be uh, people who took control, like Scandinavians or something. And we are more interested in the latter part of the, uh, uh, in the first part of the uh, 10th century, when uh, that occupation was ended by Anglo-Saxons. So we are trying to see if all that whole melting pot of people is uh, is translated into archaeology, and as we have two, only two sites that are excavated that uh, for the uh, early Middle Ages, we have to deal with what we've got. Them. <laughs> so at first, uh, we have the Camp de Peran in Pedran. Uh, just uh, for reference, Pedran is paying my PhD, so <laughs> and uh, this place was. Uh, excavated in the 80s so and there were and they, the first thing they found was a, a coin from York so of course what happened they thought it was a Viking central a, cent, a settlement and also because it was destroyed uh, at least they supposed it was destroyed because the whole wall that, uh, that encircles the uh, place is petrified so it uh, it has burned and has uh, uh, melted together. But yeah. so the uh, the archaeologist who uh, who studied this place thought it is of course destroyed by uh, the return of the Bretons when they kicked out the Vikings. Only problem is to burn like uh, to melt like one cubic meter of stones and it's granite. It's not like uh, easy to burn. <laughs> you need the whole forest that's next to it, and it's 300 meters long. So. <laughs> I don't think it was an accident, to be honest. So um, this place is situated actually quite uh, uh, interestingly, interestingly, sorry, next to uh, uh, this. Uh, well, at nine kilometers from the sea, and we know that uh, uh, there, there's a river uh, passing next to it, and we know that that's at the mouth of that river during the end of the sixth century. There was a port town. So yeah, that is an interesting thing we hope to 
developed further. And it's also situated next to um, uh, Ro uh, Roman roads that was still used during uh, the early Middle Ages because it is mentioned in several textual evidence. Yeah. So, the Camp uh, Peron has uh, uh, given us several artifacts because we, uh, it, it was thought to be a Viking settlement between very big. Uh, yeah. But you have to see, they only excavated like 10% of the site. So, of course, we don't have every, uh, everything. We don't know everything about it. Yeah. But that 10% has given like 600 artifacts. So it's really big. And uh, um, in this case, we also have like the, uh, it's, it, it's the only place I know of in, uh, in this part of Brittany that conserves like uh, textiles. We have, uh, 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 tech, we have textiles from, uh, from this site that are like 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. It's really big. And it's from the 10th century, so it's nice. But I'm going to talk about uh, is it a Viking settlement or not, and yeah, why not? So we have a cauldron that uh, seems to be, one, uh, uh, when you see the, the decorations, it seems to be one that was found, also found in the uh, naval, uh, in the ship tomb of Ile de Groix, that's in the south of Brittany. But it's also, we find also similar uh, artifacts in Norway, so of course, what we think about is, oh, the Vikings brought it. We don't know about anything about it. It's just, it can be trade, it can be anything. Yeah? But the interesting part of this was that the cauldron was filled with grain yeah? that was burned. And a study of the University of uh, Amsterdam showed that that kind of grain couldn't uh, grow around Peran. Yeah? It was only uh, it could only uh, grow in uh, a humid zone like uh, uh, a marsh or something like that, and we don't have that around it. So either the landscape changed or it came, didn't came from around, so we don't know what uh, this means. And there was a second uh, object that, uh, that the excavators thought, it's Vikings, uh, it's Scandinavian, sorry. So the site has to be Scandinavian. And it's just uh, a St. Peter's penny from York. Yeah. But of course, look into your uh, wallets. You have euros from like Spain, from Germany. And in that time, it wasn't different. Yeah. It was just the, uh, the value of the money that was important, not the, where the coin was from. Yeah. And, but it's uh, interesting because, well, uh, the Scandinavian uh, kingdom around York was like, not very stable, let's be honest. Yeah. So we can date it quite uh, quite uh, simply. Yeah. So we're still in that time frame of the uh, of the beginning of the 10th century. So still they are thinking that it's because of that it's Viking. But, yeah. but those are two objects of the 600. They are all the rest of it is Franks and Bretons. Yeah. We have uh, a carding tool, so to untangle wool. Uh, wool. Yeah. We have uh, weapons like swords. Uh, here you see, like for example, a uh, Peterson X type, like uh, actually the one you see there in the glass uh, 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 thing. Sorry, yeah. it's the same type. Yeah. But that's the interesting part: the ceramics, the pottery. Is actually local, but at the same time, it's not, because um, there are excavation. Uh, there was an excavation next to it. That's uh, where the clay was uh, was studied, and the clay showed to, uh, uh, from uh, the same uh, kind of clay was local. But the ty uh, type of vessel is very similar to what we find in Dorestad in the Netherlands. So. Uh, uh, is it just uh, an influence, or is it just pure luck that they made the same thing? It's it's also possible. We uh, can't know what happened here. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, 
it's an interesting site, but I don't have time to explain everything because otherwise we would be here for the next two years. <laughs> but I'm also talking about Brésilien in Paul. Uh, it's in Brittany too. And it's actually a more recent excavation. And it's up at the southern end of the same Roman road uh, that was used in that time. So uh, that is why we are interested in, in it. And here, as it's more recent, uh, the person who studied it, he was more inclined to think they're Bretons, but what brought those uh, objects to Brittany? Uh, so there are two uh, objects I'm going to talk about. It's, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, so it's, uh, uh, Camperan was so at around Saint-Brieuc, and uh, the Roman road goes to the uh, black circle where Brésilien is situated. And this place is more aristocratic because we didn't find, uh, they, well, we, I'm not, I was not there, sorry. Uh, they didn't find any uh, weaponry or, or something like that, uh, like in Peran. Peran we have a lot of uh, weaponry, and here we have none of it. So we don't know who lived there. They, they, they think it's aristocratic, but because of the finds, they, uh, and they, they were discovered there. But we don't know what what the people were like who lived there. So there are two. Uh, uh, two uh, objects I'm going to talk about. First, it's uh, a piece of glass that they found, and it was uh, dated to the 9th century, but at the same time, they uh, thought it was the vandal type of, uh, uh, of glass that is called the Valesgarde type, and that's the 8th century. So what happened, we don't know, uh, but as you see, uh, on the map, there's a lot of uh, places where they found this type of glass, but only one in Brittany. So we uh, see that it's just impossible to, to say if it's trade, if it's gift giving, if it's just a person who went there that brought it back. We just don't know what happened. Right? And um, so here we have also a religious artifact that was a bronze part of a cross, and uh, Mr. Lovelock from the University of Nottingham uh, thought it was from Ireland. So we have a new connection to another place in Europe that we didn't have already. So, and uh, yeah, it's so as you can see, there there are a lot of influences in Brittany, but we don't know anything about the Bretons themselves. So. Is it influence, is it trade, or is it just local production that we think is foreign? That's also a point we need to point out. So apparently there are extensive connections, at least. Trade networks may be a little bit ambitious to say, but at least there are clearly um, uh, connections with other parts of uh, Europe and mostly with the British Isles. And in Brittany, we see that until the later Middle Ages, that Brittany was very much turned towards England and uh, Scotland with, for trade, and not to the Fran uh, French kingdom, which is kind of uh, uh, strange because like, they share border with them. And uh, the Frankish artifacts are, of course, results of uh, uh, either trade or the, the presence of uh, Frankish garrisons. And actually the sword, it, we had uh, the opportunity to, when it was restored, to study it. And there was clearly um, the same technical uh, uh, manufacturing as the swords they find in the Rhine Valley. So it's we see that there are many connections with actually quite far away, but what those connections are, we have no clue. <laughs> yeah. So, and also a limitation of this uh, 
paper is all uh, of my PhD is also that artifacts are all coming from aristocratic settlements, or at least uh, uh, settlements that seem aristocratic. If they are, okay, but how did the local population, the like 99% of the real population, how did they experience these kinds of uh, uh, connections? I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. From Poland as well as from Africa, Center for Studies in Archaeology from the University of Montana. We spoke about uh, the representation between the Mediterranean and Atlantic. What arrived in the Kingdom of Portugal in the late Middle Ages. So before starting my presentation, uh, I would like to thank the organizers of this Congress, the opportunity um, to be here, uh, presenting what is now uh, ongoing work within the scope of the doctoral project I am developing, titled The Transition Ceramics from the 13th to 15th Centuries in Southern Portugal. In this sense, and as stated in the title of the presentation, I will talk about uh, the imports that arrived uh, in the Kingdom of Portugal during this chronological period. Uh, so, geographically, the area under study corresponds to the mainland of Portugal and the islands of Madeira and Azores when they become part of the kingdom. In order to synthesize the available data on imports, it is important to analyze the available sources, which encompass written sources, iconography, and culminate in archaeological records. Regarding written sources, for the Portuguese case, the most common ones include charters, council minutes, ordinance, and regulations, in addition to inventories of assets. Um, and in the case of the um, in the case of the charters, it is evident that the distinction between imported ceramics and locally produced ones is clear, as is the need to legislate and consequently tax what circulates in the kingdom. In this sense, there are multiple references scattered throughout the entire territory um, that point to this dynamic. Although I'm not exhaustively referring to this type of document, given their quantity, I want uh, to point out there are differences between them um, which can be more or less specific depending on the context. So I'll give you some examples uh, to illustrate what I, am, uh, what I was talking about. On one hand, there are charters um, such as those of Lisbon and uh, Leiria, which have various uh, titles safeguarding not only local but also foreign production, while also regulating the payments of tools for goods entering and leaving by water or, and land or solely by land. At the same time, they stipulate different prices between glazed and unglazed ceramics produced uh, within the kingdom, as well as glazed and unglazed ceramics coming from abroad and their respective methods of payment. On the other hand, as is the case of uh, Silves, there is mention of specific potteries while um, simultaneously leaving uh, room for others for ex of external origins for ceramic vessels, which, regardless of being glazed or unglazed, would be taxed in the same way. In the case of Guarda, however, the taxation rules are lighter, with a different different price applied to ceramic vessels, whether glazed or unglazed from within or outside the kingdom. In the cases of uh, Arganil and Loza, the same price is applied to any vessel, regardless of whether it is from within or outside the kingdom. So, uh, as for the other types of documents mentioned of, of imported ceramics, are only, uh, we can only talk about inventories of goods or wheels. And uh, as you can see, this map, we have uh, only these four places signed with the written sources for this period, and the ones that have that mention imports are, uh, um, refer are uh, reported uh, in Lisbon. So don't panic. This is Portuguese, okay? But I will explain you. Uh, you will understand. This is just to show that even uh, me, that as Portuguese, have some issues. 
to understand some of the terms that are used here. So this first example um, is uh, corresponds to the inventory of Katarina Loba's assets and is dated from 1498, where pieces such as pictures from Malaga and jars from Seville um, are mentioned. There is also an interesting detail in this list that refers to the distinction between pieces from Valencia and Malaga, revealing that while the lid is similar to pieces originated from Malaga, possibly being an imitation of them, it differs from this because it is made in Valencia. Furthermore, it is common to observe that the mentioned forms often have indication of their functionality, as is the case with the Seville jars, which was commonly, uh, commonly used uh, for storing vinegar. Another, another example, um, it's a little bit, uh, it's, uh, from, it's a little bit uh, late, uh, from the 16th century, reveals artifacts that uh, very likely correspond to pieces that had wider circulation already during the 15th century, and then in the 16th century. In this other case, we again observe the, dis the distinction between the various uh, types of Malagas, with some coming from Castile, such as the pots, and others from Valencia, such as the basins or plates, but also those coming from Malaga, corresponding to the flange bowels and their covers. Additionally, there is a greater quantity of imported products in this document, and the emergence of other production centers that had not previously appeared. In, and in this specific case as well, there is information about the functionality of some objects, such as the Castilian pots, which should be used to store sweets um, like uh, sugar cow tongues, it's a uh, sweet that the, the lady re specifically re refers that uh, is stored here. Um, re regarding iconography, existing works are, like written source, very scarce, and no paintings depicting ceramic vessels, especially imports, have been found before the 16th century. Nevertheless, it is plausible that the realities depicted by Portuguese authors of the 16th century, particularly in the first half of the century, may include pieces that were part of the daily life of the 15th and the 16th century, revealing a continuity in the forms, tastes, and customs of those who acquired them, whether they were local or regional productions or even exogenous ones. Among the, the various paintings of the 16th century that have been analyzed, it is worth noting uh, this one, uh, titled Transit of the Virgin, by Christophe von Figueiredo, dated from 1525, which features the representation of an imported ceramic uh, vessel, this bowl sign of sign. In another painting, uh, belonging to the doors of the altarpiece of Sant Eloy of the Goldsmiths, which was in the Basilica of Mercy in Barcelona, but cannot be appreciated in the National um, Art Museum of Catalonia, dated between um, uh, 1526 and 1529, and authored by the Portuguese painter Pedro Nunes, a similar example of a bowl can also be observed. In both cases, these pieces, along with others, such as the common ceramic jar, or the plates that would commonly be used for serving and consuming food seem to correspond to an example of the so-called metallic luster rare or golden pottery, whose production may be attributed to the potteries of Valencia, Granada, or Malaga. Regarding archaeological evidence, the bibliographic review conducted thus so far has revealed the publication of 333 articles, of which only 137 mentioned the occurrence of imports. When considering the distribution across the territory, it is the Lisbon and Tagus Valley region that stands out with the highest number of publications, 138, as well as articles mentioning exogenous production, 59, followed by the Algarve with significantly lower numbers. The region of Alentejo, Centro and North show greater discrepancy between the numbers of published articles and the quantity of record imports. However, the Madeira archipelago derivates from this uh, dynamic as most of the few existent publications reveal a lot of as productions. As for the articles of a generic scope, as they constitute synthesis on different aspects, not necessarily imports, it is natural to observe this difference in numbers. The systematic analysis of this data also allows us to understand the territorial, territorial dispersion and representativeness of the recorded imports, 
in the given location. Looking at this map from 1560, that of Portugal and the Algarve, it is easier to deduce that the most occurrences of the imported ceramic are located near port areas, either along the coastline or following the course of rivers inland, thus reaching more distant sites. In the few cases where this is not the case, such as Penamacor or Fundão, like this one, for instance, the presence of exogenous productions is more room, in more remote locations may be explained by the existence of well-established land communication routes that complemented maritime routes and are, and are close to these places. It is plausible that these routes correspond to the Roman road system, which remained in use even after the fall of the empire and survivor in some cases to the present day. Their relevance is such that repairs have been made over time, maintaining existing connections and integrating seemingly distant points into commercial flows. I know this is too small, but I will uh, highlight the, uh, the main uh, conclusions with this. In terms of provenance, the origins are uh, diverse and include European production centers such as Spanish, French, Italian, Flemish, English, Germanic and North European pottery, as well as North African with mention to the Marine Kingdom and even Oriental ones such as China. Regarding dispersion, it is generically noticeable that imports from Spanish workshops have a greater dissemination through the territory, being present in almost um, urban areas except Guimarães, Viseu, Fundão, or Torres Novas. In a secondary position, French production emerged primarily detected in the north and central regions, contrasting with their scarce presence in the other regions. Alongside dispersion, it is also important to mention the representativeness of each pottery center. Thus, it is possible to perceive cases where greater dispersion correlates directly with greater representativeness, as is the example of Valencia, whose pottery productions occur more frequently across the territory and in larger quantities at each site where they were unearthed. Conversely, it is also noted that situations exist where lesser diffusion translates into lower representativeness, such as in Galicia, León, Florence, Pisa, Umbria or Tuscany. The second set with the greatest dispersion and numerical expression corresponds to civilian potteries, which are, to date, absent in the North region. As for French productions, it is Saint-Onge that has the greatest expression uh, throughout the territory, including in places where its rep representativeness is marginal. Finally, it's worth noting that among all sites with imports, Lisbon, due to its status as the capital of the kingdom, the kingdom possesses the highest number and variety of production centers, where products from Italian, Flemish, and Northern and Central European potteries arrive in addition to Spanish and French uh, workshops. Uh, here are some examples of imports found in excavation, with highlights including the specimens of, specimens of balls and cups from Tavira, which are uh, or, um, original, or, uh, which were produced in Seville, the preachers from Santos discovered in Lisbon, and the fragments of two open forms, possibly bowls, discovered in Lule, which originate, are origin, um, are, uh, were produced in Savona and Valencia. As a final remarks, the occurrence of imports, their representativeness and dispersion in the territory of the Kingdom of Portugal are not uniform. There are different consumption patterns in various urban centers, centers during the late Middle Ages, which can be influenced by powers, individuals, and the importance of one place relative to another. The factors that determine the acquisition of products over another are multiple and complementary, which purchasing power, taste, and quality of the piece being crucial elements in the decision to buy. Analyzing the above, it seems reasonable to assert that the predominance of Spanish pottery, notably Valencia and Seville, over other production centers may signify the uh, existence of a quality-price relationship that coupled with well-established trade routes facilitated their diffusion to more sites. The standardization of forms and decorative solutions, on the other hand, reduced production costs and allowed more people to acquire them. Finally, the absence of ev evidence is not synonymous with the evidence of absence, as existing data are conditioned by archaeology. In fact, the more intensive archaeological activity and articles published about a particular site 
necessarily provide more data and, uh, than when compared with another location where research and publication are more limited. Moreover, the pace of archaeological investigation does not align with the scientific production that occurs, with a clear priority given to the former over the latter, inevitably leading to a partial view of the reality at hand. Additionally, the aspect of information being scattered, lacking serious debates, and that an attempt to systematize knowledge also contributes to this scenario. Thank you very much. local and they have 
very good and a good um, uh, workshop. It's not just for the supervisor, it's also important outside the, the master, but you can see in another uh, reason as well. It's the uh, research. Yeah, can I ask you? So you have one piece from China. Do you know what it was? No, I have. Uh, it was in the bibliography. Uh, so uh, I, I didn't focus uh, here, but uh, what I did is collect all the evidence. This is not a critical approach. It is supposed to be here when I write the thesis because there are some pieces such as the Marie Christina that we are. Uh, 